Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Tom Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. Before we get on with the show, I'd like to take a couple of minutes of your time. I've mentioned recently our partnership with Sleep Phones, and as I've mentioned, they've decided to provide Sleepy Time Tales listeners with a great bonus. Up until the end of September, using the link I provide in the show notes and the promo code SleepyTime will give you a 10% discount on any orders over $99.95. So that's the price of one pair of wireless Sleep Phones, or a bunch of wired ones if you wanted to get some for the whole family. They really are a great product, perfect for Sleepy Time Tales listeners, and this is a limited time offer as I say, so please don't delay, I wouldn't want you to miss out. I've also got a whole bunch of designs up on both TeePublic and Redbubble, so if you'd like to get yourself some new t-shirts or stickers or anything in that vein, and also the vast majority isn't even Sleepy Time Tales branded, so you can support the show without having to explain to anyone what it is. There's also obviously the usual direct support options um, in the Patreon, which is monthly, the tip jar, which is once off if you just feel like throwing a little bit of something my way, and any of those are very much appreciated. And of course, I recently left my job to start up as a podcast editor. So if you are looking to start a podcast or you have one and would like to offload the technical nitty gritty stuff to somebody else and give you a bit more free time, feel free to give me a shout at dave at brightfoxaudio.com and the link to that is also in the show notes and last but not least i've got to give a shout out to the music which is sweet night and friends by kumiko their always excellent work is up on their website at loyaltyfreakmusic.com so i recommend going and taking a look thanks for your time let's get back to the show so what exactly is sleepy time tales what is it for What is this strange idea, this strange thing, this podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to? But in the 21st century, lack of sleep is a health crisis, and this is a podcast intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3 a.m.? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. Sleepy Time Tales is intended to be used as a distraction to what keeps you awake at night, or sometimes background noise or company. That's why I make these episodes quite long, so that I'm here for you, without any pressure of the end coming. Now as far as I know, there are a couple of different ways to engage. The main idea is that it gives you something to focus on, a story or an event that lets you keep your mind on a specific point, to stop it from spinning out into stress and anxieties, to focus just enough not to resist the embrace of a night's sleep when it comes for you. Or maybe you need some kind of background noise, something simple. Some people like white noise or the sound of the ocean or the sound of the wind in the trees or the sound of rain or some boring dude just droning on in the background. But however you're listening and however you're engaging, it's very important that you don't try to force it. Just keep a light mental grip on the thread of the story and on my voice and allow the need for sleep to come for you. Now, obviously, I'm hoping that you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode. But it's important that you don't feel pressurized. If this is your first night with us, this probably actually won't work for you. I recommend giving it a solid three nights try, working consistently to try to get used to it. 
Because after all, it's a bit of an odd idea, so maybe you need some time to get used to it. Maybe you need to get some time to used to having background noise or my accent. So I do recommend that you give it a bit of a chance. It's also possible that early on at least one episode isn't long enough. Or maybe your problem isn't so much going to sleep. Maybe you're someone who finds yourself waking up in the middle of the night. What I recommend, because it's what works for me, is to let the podcast run all night. Download a whole bunch of episodes, enough to go through the whole night if possible. Put them in a playlist in your podcast uh, client of choice and let them go. That way, if it's still running when you wake up, you can just put your earbuds back in and go back to sleep again. And you can even do the same thing if you're someone who wakes up before the alarm, 30 minutes or 60 minutes before. And you may wonder, what's the point of an extra 60 minutes or 30 minutes of sleep? But I've had people actually thank me for suggesting that they do this, because there is something about allowing yourself relaxation right before the alarm that's satisfying on a whole new level. So it's important as you listen to try and relax. And it may seem strange to you as we've established, so give it a chance. Because I'm here to work with you, to create a safe space, a cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream. We return this week to the Book of the Ancient Greeks by Dorothy Mills. Chapter 3 The Mainland Number 1 Troy and the First Discoveries An ancient tradition told the story of how Helen, the beautiful wife of Menelaus, king of Sparta, had been carried off by Paris, son of the king of Troy, and of how the Greeks collected a mighty army under Agamemnon, king of Argos, and his brother Menelaus, and sailed to Troy to bring back the lost Helen. For ten years they besieged Troy, during which time they had many adventurers and many hero deeds were performed. Glorious Hector of the Glancing Helm was slain by Achilles' fleet of foot, and the gods and goddesses themselves came down from high Olympus and took sides, some helping the Trojans and some the Greeks. At length Troy was taken, and the Greek heroes returned home. But their homeward journey was fraught with danger, and they experienced many hardships. The wise Odysseus especially went through many strange adventures before he reached Greece again. All these tales were put together by the Greek poet Homer, and may be read in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Until the beginning of the 19th century, no one had seriously thought that there was any truth in these tales. But in 1822, a boy was born in Germany who was to make the most extraordinary discoveries about these lands of legend. Henry Schliemann was the son of a German pastor who was well versed in all these ancient legends. And as he grew up, he learned all about Troy and the old Greek tales. He lived in a romantic neighborhood. Behind his father's garden was a pool, from which every midnight a maiden was said to rise, holding a silver bowl in her hand and there were similar tales connected with the neighbouring hills and forests. But there was not much money to educate the young Schliemann, and when he was fourteen years old he was taken as errand boy by a country grocer. And this was not perhaps the occupation a romantic-minded youth would have chosen, but there was no help for it. One evening there came into the shop a man, who after sitting down and asking for some refreshment, suddenly began to recite Greek poetry. The errand boy stopped his work to listen, and long afterwards he described the effect this poetry had on him. 
That evening he recited to us about a hundred lines of the poet, observing the rhythmic cadence of the verses. Although I did not understand a syllable, the melodious sound of the words made a deep impression upon me, and I wept bitter tears over my unhappy fate. Three times over did I get him to repeat to me those divine verses, rewarding his trouble with three glasses of whiskey, which I bought with a few pence that made up my whole wealth. From that moment I never ceased to pray God that by his grace I might yet have the happiness of learning Greek. A few years later Schliemann was taken as errand boy in a business house in Amsterdam, and he had to run on all kinds of errands and carry letters to and from the post. He says of this time, I never went on my errands, even in the rain, without having my book in hand and learning something by heart. I never waited at the post office without reading or repeating a passage in my mind. Schliemann got on well, and the time came when he was able to found a business of his own. Now at last he had time to learn Greek, and he read everything written by or about the ancient Greeks on which he could lay his hands. And then came the time to which he had been looking forward all his life. He was able to free himself from his business and to sail for the Greek lands. Schliemann believed that the tales of Troy were founded on true historic facts, but everybody laughed at this opinion and he was often ridiculed for holding it so firmly. Now, however, he was to prove himself victorious, for he went to the place where he believed Troy had once stood and began to dig. His expectations were more than he realized, for he found six cities, one of which was later conclusively proved to be the Troy of Homer. Homer had written about what was really true, and though legends and myths had been woven into his poem, the main events had really taken place, and a civilization which up to that time had, as it was thought, never existed, suddenly came out into the record of history. 2. Massini and the Turins All of these discoveries sent a thrill of excitement through the world, and of course at first many mistakes were made. Because Troy was found to have really existed, everything found there was immediately connected with the Trojan heroes of the Iliad, and some things which were obviously legendary were treated as facts. Schliemann himself was not entirely free from these first exaggerations, but encouraged by what he had already discovered, he determined to find still more. Now Pausanias, an ancient Greek traveller, had written a book about his travels, and one of the places he had visited was Marcinia on the mainland of Greece. Here he said he had seen the tomb of Agamemnon, who on his return from Troy had been murdered by his wife, Clymenestra, and hastily buried. Up to the time of Schliemann, no one had seriously believed that there had ever been such a person as Agamemnon. But the spirit of discovery was in the air, and what might not still be found. Schliemann determined that having proved that Troy had once existed, he would find truth in still more legends. And he went to Mycenae and began to excavate The early Greeks had not the same beliefs about the future life that the Egyptians had, but they did believe that death meant removing the dwelling place on earth to one beneath the earth, and so the early Greek tomb was built in much the same shape as the earthly house. These Greeks did not allow man to go naked and alone into the other world. They gave to the departed to take with them all that was best and finest of his earthly possessions. They filled the tomb with everything that could add to his comfort, and if he were a king or a great chief, he would be surrounded by things 
which would mark him out from other men and point to his great position. This being so, Schliemann thought that a king's tomb would be easily recognized, and he opened what he thought was probably the burial place of Agamemnon. What he saw swept him off his feet with excitement. Before doing anything else, he sent a telegram to the king of Greece, which was speedily published throughout the world. The telegram said, With great joy, I announce to your majesty that I found the tomb of Agamemnon. The sensation created by this news was tremendous. That it was really the tomb of the wide-ruling king of Argos was perhaps uncertain. That it was undoubtedly the tomb of a great lord who had lived at the same time, and at his death had been buried in barbaric magnificence. Diadems, pendants, necklaces, ornaments of all kinds, goblets, plates, vases, all of pure gold, were piled high in confusion in the tomb. And close by were other tombs, also filled with untold treasure. In one grave alone, Schliemann counted 870 objects made of the purest gold. This was only the beginning of excavations at Mycenae. Later on, a great palace was uncovered, and the other works at Tarins near the sea showed that another palace had existed there. These buildings were very unlike the palace at Knossos. The latter had no fortifications, but these were strongly fortified. They had great walls, so mighty that in ancient times the Greeks thought the walls of Tyrus had been built by demons and Pausanias considered them even more wonderful than the pyramids. The fortress palace of Mycenae was entered by the gate of the Lionesses, which was reached by a rather narrow road, along which only seven men could march abreast. This seems a rather mean approach to so splendid a palace, but such narrow approaches were necessary in those warlike times for they made it more difficult for an enemy to approach the gates. Mycenae and Tyrans are the best known today of the ancient fortress palaces on the mainland of Greece, but at the time when they were built there were many others. The great lords frequently chose the hilltops for their dwellings, for the sake of better security and for the protection they could then in their turn afford the surrounding country people in times of danger. Most of these fortress palaces were in the neighborhood of the coast, for no true Greek was ever quite happy unless he were within easy reach and sight of the sea. Life in the Homeric Age The Homeric Age was the age of the great hero kings and chiefs. Most of these were supposed to be descended from the gods, and they shine through the mists of early days in Greece as splendid, gorgeous figures. Heaven was nearer to the earth in those days, and the gods came down from Olympus and mixed familiarly with man. Life was very difficult in this heroic age from the life of historic Greece, and it is evident from the excavations and discoveries that have been made that it was a civilization with distinct characteristics of its own which preceded what is known of the Greece of history. It was an age when the strong man ruled by the might of his own or strong arm, and piracy was quite common. Manners and customs were very primitive and simple, yet they were combined with a great material splendor. Women held a high position in the society, and they wore most gorgeous clothes. A Marcinian lady arrayed in her best, would wear a dress of soft wool, exquisitely dyed, or of soft shining linen, and she would glitter with golden ornaments, a diadem of gold on her head, gold pins in her hair, gold bands around her throat, gold bracelets on her arms, and her hands covered with rings. Schliemann says that the women he found in one of the tombs he opened were literally laden with jewellery. The fortress palaces were the chief houses, 
and the huts of the dependents of the king or chief would be crowded round them. But these huts have, of course, disappeared. The palaces themselves were strongly built, with courtyards and chambers opening from them. There is building beyond building, and the court of the house is cunningly wrought with a wall and battlements, and well fenced to the folding doors. No man may hold it in disdain. Excavations have proved that the Homeric palaces did indeed exist, and well fortified though they were, their gardens and vineyards and fountains must have made of them very pleasant dwelling places. There was a gleam as it were of sun or moon through the high-roofed hall of great-hearted Alcinius. Brazen were the walls which ran this way and that from the threshold to the inmost chamber, and round them was a frieze of blue, and golden were the doors that closed in the good house. Silver were the doorposts that were set on the brazen threshold, and silver the lintel thereupon, and the hook of the door was of gold, and on either side stood golden hounds and silver, which Hephaestus had wrought by his cunning, to guard the palace of great-hearted Alcinous, being free from death and age all their days. And within were seats arrayed against the wall of this way and that, from the threshold even to the inmost chamber, and thereon were spread light coverings finely woven, the handiwork of women. There the chieftains were wont to sit eating and drinking, for they had continual store. Yea, and there were youths fashioned in gold, standing on firm-set bases, with flaming torches in their hands, giving light through the night to the feasters in the palace. And yet fifty handmaids in the house, and some grind the yellow grain on the millstone, and others weave webs and turn the yarn as they sit, restless as the leaves of the tall poplar tree, and the soft olive oil drops off that linen, so closely is it woven. And without the courtyard, hard by the door, is a great garden, and a hedge runs round on either side, and there grow tall trees blossoming, pear trees and pomegranates and apple trees with bright fruit and sweet figs, and olives in their bloom. The fruit of these trees never perisheth, neither faileth winter nor summer, enduring through all the year. Evermore the west wind blowing brings some fruit to birth and ripens others. Pear upon pear waxes old and apple on apple, yea, and cluster ripens upon cluster of the grape and fig upon fig. There too hath he a fruitful vineyard planted, whereof the one part is being daily dried by the heat, a sunny spot on level ground, while other great men are gathering, and yet for others they are treading in the winepress. In the foremost row are unripe grapes that cast blossom, and others there be that are growing back to vintaging. There too skirting the furthest line all manner of garden beds, planted trimly that are perpetually fresh, and therein are two fountains of water, where one scatters his streams all about the garden, and the other runs over against it, beneath the threshold of the courtyard, and issues by the lofty house, and then stood the town folk draw water. These were the splendid gifts of the gods of the palace of Elsinus. A blue frieze, just like the one described above, has been found both at Mycenae and Tyrans, the furniture in these houses was very splendid. We read of well-wrought chairs, of goodly carven chairs, and of chairs inlaid with ivory and silver, of inlaid seats and polished tables, of jointed bedsteads, and of a fair bedstead with inlaid work of gold and silver and ivory, of close-fitting folding doors, and of doors with silver handles, and of rugs of soft wool rich and varied with the ornaments and vessels used, goodly golden ewers and silver basins, two-handled cups, 
silver baskets and tripods, mixing bowls of flowered work, all of silver, and one that was beautifully wrought, all of silver, and the lips thereof finished with gold. The most famous cup of all was that of the clear-voiced orator Nestor. This had four handles on which were golden doves feeding, and it stood two feet from the ground. Very skillful was all the work done in metal at this time, and the warriors went out arrayed in flashing bronze, bearing staves studded with golden nails, bronze-headed spears and silver-studded swords. Their greaves were fastened with silver clasps. They wore bronze-bound helmets, glittering girdles and belts with golden buckles. Only a god could have fashioned a wondrous shield such as Achilles bore, on which are depicted scenes from the life of the time. The description of it can be read in the Iliad. But the tombs at Marcinia and elsewhere have yielded weapons and treasures, very similar to those used by the heroes in Homer. The Greek Migrations It was more than a thousand years after the pyramids had been built that Crete reached a golden age. When Knossos was destroyed, the centers of civilization on the mainland, such as Marcinia and Tyrans, became of great importance, and life was lived as Homer had described it. All this was the Greece of the heroic age, the Greece to which the Greeks of the later historical times looked back as to something that lay far behind them. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the site of Mycenae was just as it had remained until the excavations of Schliemann, and in the 2nd century AD, a Greek poet sang of Mycenae, The cities of the hero age, thine eyes may seek in vain, save where some wrecks of ruin still break the level plain. So once I saw Mycenae, the ill-starred, barren height, too bleak for goats to pasture, the goat herds point the site. And as a pastor Greybeard said, here used to stand of old, a city built by giants and passing rich in gold. Even to the Greeks of historical times there's a great gap between the return of the heroes from Troy and the beginnings of their own historic Greece. The gap has not yet been entirely filled up. It is even now a more shadowy and misty period to us than the age of heroes. But it was during these mysterious centuries that there were the wanderings among the peoples, that the restlessness and disturbance spoken of by the Egyptians. It was a dark period in the history of Greece. Wandering tribes, tall and fair men, came from out the forests of the north, over the mountains and through the passes into Greece. Others came from the east. Some again came by sea, driven out from their island homes by invaders. There was fighting and slaying and taking of prisoners. The old civilization was broken down. But slowly something new arose in its place. There were enemies on all sides, but gradually those who were left of the conquered made terms with the conquerors. They abandoned their old language and adopted that of the newcomers and dwelt together and were known as Greeks. The older civilizations had done their work and had perished. The time had come for the mind of man to make greater advances than he had ever dreamed of, and in the land of Greece this period begins with the coming of the Greeks. The Greeks Chapter 1. The Land of Greece The land to which people belong always helps to form their character and to influence their history. And the land of Greece, its mountains and plains, its sea and sky, was of great importance in making the Greeks what they were. The map shows us three parts of Greece. Northern Greece, a rugged mountainous land, then central Greece with a fertile plain running down to more mountains, 
and then across a narrow sea, the peninsula known as Peloponnesus. One striking feature of the whole country is the nearness of every part of it to the sea. The coast is deeply indented with gulfs and bays, and the neighbouring sea is dotted with islands. It is a land of sea and mountains. The soil is not rich. About one third of the country is mountainous and unproductive and consists of rock. Forests are found in the lower lands, but they are not like our forests. The trees are smaller and the sun penetrates even the thickest places. The trees most often found are the laurel, the oleander and the myrtle. The forests were thicker in ancient times. They are much thinner now, owing to the carelessness of peasants, who without thinking of the consequences have wastefully cut down the trees. The land used by the Greeks for pasture was that which was not rich enough for cultivation. Goats and sheep and pigs roamed over this land, and the bees made honey there. In ancient times there was no sugar, and honey was a necessary article of food. The cultivated land lay in the plains. The mountains of Greece do not form long valleys, but they enclose plains. And it was here that the Greeks cultivated their corn and wine and oil, and that their cities grew up separated from each other by the mountains. Corn, wine, and oil were absolutely necessary for life in the Mediterranean world. Every Greek city tried to produce enough corn, chiefly wheat and barley, for its inhabitants. For the difficulties and sometimes dangers were great when a city was not self-sufficing. Wine, too, was necessary. For the Greeks, though they were a temperate nation, could not do without it. Oil was even more important, for it was used for cleansing purposes, for food and for lighting. Even today the Greeks use but little butter, and where we eat bread and butter they use bread and olives, or bread and goat's cheese. The oil is cultivated all over Greece, but especially in Attica, where it was regarded as the gift of Athena herself. It was looking across the sea to Attica that, in Salamis, filled with the foaming of billows and murmur of bees, old Telamon stayed from his roaming, long ago on a throne of the seas. Looking out on the hills olive-laden, enchanted where first from the earth, the grey gleaming fruit of the maiden Athena had birth. The olive is not a large tree, and its chief beauty is in the shimmer of the leaves, which glisten a silvery grey in the sunshine. Olive trees take a long time to mature. They do not yield a full crop for sixteen years or more, and they are nearly fifty years old before they reach their fullest maturity. It is no wonder that the olive is a symbol for peace. Herodotus, the earliest of the Greek historians, wrote that it was the lot of Hellas to have its seasons far more fairly tempered than other lands. The Mediterranean is a borderland, midway between the tropics and the colder north. In summer, the cool winds from the north blow upon Greece, making the climate pleasant. But in winter, they blow from every quarter, and according to the poet Hesiod, were a great trouble to mortals. Greek life was a summer life, and the ancient Greeks lived almost entirely out of doors, sailing over the sea, attending to all their affairs in the open air, from the shepherd watching his flock on the mountain side to the philosopher discussing politics in the marketplace. But the Greeks were a hardy race, and though the winter life must have been chilly and uncomfortable, life went on just the same till the warm spring sunshine made them forget the winter cold. What kind of people were made by these surroundings, and what was their spirit? The hardy mountain life developed a free and independent spirit, 
and as the mountains cut off the dwellers in the different plains from each other, separate city-states were formed, each with its own laws and government. This separation of communities was a source of weakness to the country as a whole, but it developed the spirit of freedom and independence in the city dweller, as well as in the mountaineer. All parts of Greece were within easy reach of the sea, and the Greeks naturally became sailors. They loved the sea and were at home upon it, and the seafaring life developed the same spirit of freedom and independence. The mild climate relieved the Greeks of many cares which came to those who live in harsher lands. But the atmosphere was clear and bracing, which stimulated clear thinking. The Greeks were the first great thinkers in the world. They were possessed of a passion for knowing the truth about all things, in heaven and earth. And few people have sought truth with greater courage and clearness of mind than the Greeks. The poor soil of their land made it necessary for them to work hard and to form habits of thrift and economy. It was not a soil that made them rich, and so they developed a spirit of self-control and moderation, and learned how to combine simple living with high thinking to a greater degree than any other nation has ever done. But if their soil was poor, they had all around them the exquisite beauty of the mountains, sea and sky, surroundings from which they learned to love beauty in a way that has never been excelled, if, indeed, it has ever been equaled. The spirit of a nation expresses itself and its history is recorded in various ways. In the social relations of the people both with each other and with other nations. And this is called its political history. In its language, which expresses itself in its literature. And in its buildings, which is its architecture. The Greek people were lovers of freedom truth, self-control, and beauty. It is in their political history, their literature, and their architecture that we shall see some of the outward and visible signs of the spirit that inspired them. And the land of Greece is the setting in which they played their part in the history of civilization. Chapter 2 Greek Religion and the Oracles the city dwellers in Greece lived in the plains, separated from their neighbours by mountains. And this caused the development of a large number of separate communities, quite independent of each other, each having its own laws and government. But there were three things which all Greeks had in common wherever they lived. They spoke the same language, they believed in the same gods, and they celebrated together as Greeks their great national games. The Greeks called themselves Hellenes and their land Hellas. Like the Hebrews and the Babylonians, they believed that there had been a time when men had grown so wicked that the gods determined to destroy the old race of man and to create a new one. A terrible flood overwhelmed the earth until nothing of it was left visible but the top of Mount Parnassus. And here, the old legend tells us, a refuge was found by two people, Deucalion and his wife Pyra, who alone had been saved on account of their righteous lives. Slowly the waters abated until the earth was once more dry and habitable, but Deucalion and Pyra were alone and did not know what they should do. So they prayed to the gods and received as an answer to their prayer the strange command, Depart! and cast behind you the bones of your mother. At first they could not understand what was meant, but at length Deucalion thought of an explanation. He said to Pyra, The earth is the mother of us all, the stones are her bones, and perhaps it is these that we must cast behind us. So they took up the stones that were lying about and cast them behind them. And as they did so, a strange thing happened. 
The stones thrown by Deucalion became men, and those thrown by Pyra became women. And this race of men peopled the land of Greece anew. The son of Deucalion and Pyra was called Helen, and as the Greeks looked upon him as the legendary founder of their race, they called themselves and their land by his name. These earliest Greeks had very strange ideas as to the shape of the world. They thought it was flat and circular, and that Greece lay in the very middle of it, with Mount Olympus, or some maintained Delphi, as the central point of the whole world. This world was believed to be cut in two by the sea, and to be entirely surrounded by the river ocean, from which the sea and all the rivers and lakes on the earth received their waters. In the north of this world were supposed to live the Hyperboreans. They were the people who lived beyond the north winds, whose home was in the caverns in the mountains to the north of Greece. The Hyperboreans were a happy race of beings, who knew neither disease nor old age, and who, living in a land of everlasting spring, were free from all toil and labor. Far away in the south, on the banks of the river ocean, lived another happy people, the Ethiopians. They were so happy and led such blissful lives that the gods used sometimes to leave their home in Olympus and go and join the Ethiopians in their feasts and banquets. On the western edge of the earth and close to the river ocean were the Elysian fields, sometimes called the Fortunate Fields, and the islands of the Blessed. It was to this blissful place that mortals, who were especially loved by the gods, were transported without first tasting of death. And there they lived forever, set free from all the sorrows and sufferings of earth. It was a land where falls not hail or rain or any snow, nor ever wind blows loudly but it lies, deep meadowed, happy. The sun and the moon and the rosy-fingered dawn were thought of as gods who rose out of the river ocean and drove in their chariots to the air, giving light to both gods and men. What kind of religion did the Greeks have? Now, religion may be explained in many different ways, and there have been many different religions in the world, but there has never been a nation that has had no religion. From the earliest times men have realized that there were things in the world that they could not understand, and these mysteries showed them that there must be some being greater than man, who had himself been created, and it is by what is called religion that men have sought to come into relationship with this being greater than themselves. The Egyptians and their religious beliefs had been very much occupied with the idea of life after death. But at first the Greeks thought of this very little. They believed that proper burial was necessary for the future happiness of the soul, and want of this was looked upon as a very serious disaster. But beyond the insisting on due and fitting burial ceremonies, the thoughts were not much occupied with the future. The reason of this was probably because the Greeks found this life so delightful. They were filled with the joy of being alive, and were keenly interested in everything concerning life. They felt at home in the world. The gods in whom the Greeks believed were not supposed to have created the world but were themselves part of it. And every phase of this life that was so full of interest and adventure was represented by the personality of a god. First it was the outside life, nature with all its mysteries, and then all the outward activities of man. Later men found other things difficult to explain, the passions within them, love and hatred, gentleness and anger, and gradually they gave personalities to all these emotions, and thought of each as inspired by a god. The gods were thought of as very near to man, 
men and women in the heroic age claimed descent from them, and they were supposed to come down to earth and to hold frequent converse with man. The Greeks trusted their gods and looked to them for protection and assistance in all their affairs. But these gods were too human and not holy enough to be a real inspiration or to influence very much the conduct of those who believed in them. And I think I'm going to leave it there, because we're about to go into a long list of the Greek gods and we'll leave that for next time. This is a rather fascinating book, so if you'd like to pick it up where I'm leaving off, you can, as always, find it on Project Gutenberg at the link in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. But make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiku. Check out more of their work on their website, which you'll find linked in the show notes. Good night, and sweet dreams. <laughs>